Peter B. Collins, News and Comment. It's Thursday, January 5th, 2017. This podcast is dedicated to the memory of my first cousin, Kathy O'Connor Cook, who passed away at the age of 76 a few days ago. I'll be off Monday and Tuesday attending her funeral. And I have fond memories of uh, lots of fun times with Kathy. I offer my condolences to her children and grandchildren. Well, today we're still experimenting with the format of my podcast. I've gotten some interesting feedback from listeners. So if you've downloaded the show that is labeled as Part 1, what you're going to hear is uh, roughly half an hour, both segments of my podcast today. And if you've downloaded Part 2, well, you can't hear me right now because I haven't gotten there yet. But Part 2 will be focused on the whole story about Russia hacking and the... (laughs) The psychodrama that is uh, continuing in Washington, D.C. But there is other news. Tomorrow is really the final nail in the proverbial coffin. That's when the American Congress will certify the election of Donald Trump as the next president of the United States. And uh, there are still irregularities and anomalies that are not being addressed. My friend Brad Friedman at Bradblog, who's been covering election integrity issues since way, way back there, 10 or 12 years ago, well, he has important information. I've linked to his report. In Wisconsin, where they attempted the recount of the presidential vote, at least 11,000 votes were revealed to have been mistallied in a state that Trump won by a mere 22,000 votes. That's half of the margin of victory there that is called into question. He also says that only half of the ballots were permitted to be counted by hand. The cost was about half of what Green Party nominee Jill Stein was uh, extorted to pay. And the final turnout and voter registration numbers in the state are still unknown, ensuring that the results still cannot be verified as accurate even as Congress will accept the Electoral College results on Friday. And not only that, there is a group of anti-Trump lawyers who have been desperately trying to get attention of members of Congress. They point out that uh, of the some 300 uh, uh, electors who cast their votes for Donald Trump, at least 50 of them, they say, were ineligible to serve as electors, either because they didn't live in the congressional district they were representing or they held dual posts that is a, a violation of the rules of the Electoral College. And so the lawyers have urged members of Congress to uh, prepare written objections for the session. They have submitted a 1,000-page legal brief. But if history is any indication... And the Democrats, uh, you know, don't uh, get hit by lightning overnight or something dramatic like that. Uh, We're going to see a passive acceptance of the ascendance of Donald Trump. And this is a miserable example of how our political leaders do not use the system that is in place. We saw them fail to use the Electoral College as an intended uh, backstop, intended by the framers against a demagogue or somebody with uh, two cozy relations with foreign governments. (laughs) And I'm not talking about Russian hacking. I'm talking about the Trump empire's far-flung deals uh, around the globe. So uh, now we're seeing the Republicans really on the hot seat because they have promised that their first move will be to repeal and replace Obamacare. Now, they don't have a clue as to how to replace it. They talk in circles. They talk in generalities. Trump tweets that the uh, the Republicans and Democrats should get together and come up with a health care plan that really works, much less expensive, and all caps he writes, uh, he tweets, far better. That's, That's not a policy. That doesn't deal with me, okay? I know I'm covered through 2017 under the Affordable Care Act. But what happens next January? I don't know. And I don't qualify for Medicare for several months after next January. (laughs) Yeah, you can guess at my age if you want. I'm 63 right now. And so I'm just one of many Americans who doesn't know what the future holds for health care coverage. And this is going to royal the health insurance marketplace. It will provide opportunities for gouging, 
for dropping people from the rolls, letting them get sick. People will let themselves get sick. This, this is just a bad prescription all the way around. And the Republicans, of course, want to be popular. And let me just offer a couple of cautionary notes. These ideas that are promoted during political campaigns and the candidate then believes he or she has a mandate to produce for the voters. Well, we saw Bill Clinton, who tried to open up service to all gays in the military when he first became president on his first day in office. And he got smacked down by members of his own party, including Sam Nunn, the powerful Georgia senator who chaired the Armed Services Committee. And we wound up with the 18-year ugly compromise of don't ask, don't tell. Then there was Obama, who declared that he was going to close Guantanamo on his first full day in office. And that pledge remains, of course, unfulfilled eight years later. So we also saw here in California the populist uh, actor who has now replaced Trump on that bad TV show. Yeah, I'm talking about Arnold Schwarzenegger. Well, he campaigned that he was going to blow up the car tax. So first day in office with a big flourish and some special effects, Arnie just dismantles the tax that uh, was pumping money into the state coffers. And the amount that was lost by his repeal of the car tax became the basis of the red ink that dogged California throughout Schwarzenegger's uh, governorship. And it forced Jerry Brown, his successor, to raise taxes because Schwarzenegger wouldn't. So these kinds of populist, uh, you know, voter pandering moves on the first day or the first hundred days of the ascendance of a political party, very risky. And as the New York Times details today, uh, the Republicans are making some sneaky moves so that in the Senate they are going to call this a, a budget-related issue that can't be filibustered. It only requires 51 votes to pass. And so they will start by attacking the funding mechanisms, including the subsidies that get paid to people who qualify to help cover the egregious cost of health insurance these days. So first, they'll eliminate the tax penalties on people who have uh, what's called go uh, Cadillac coverage, I guess. They will eliminate tens of billions of dollars provided to states for Medicaid, and they'll repeal the subsidies for the private health exchanges. Now, the big wobbler here is what will be the effective date? How far into the future will they push this in order to buy time? Because the Republicans don't have the votes to put in uh, a, a new plan uh, that Democrats don't approve of. They can't get to 60 votes in the Senate. And so they are blocked. Now, they hope to, to punt this past the midterm elections and pray that they get a bigger majority of 60 votes so they could ram through anything they damn well please. But until then, the Republicans are very nervous, knowing that uh, they have made promises that they can't really keep. They can keep the repeal part of the promise. But the vague general notion of replacing Obamacare, well, they really don't have any ideas about that. And it's hardly a secret. Also, the House is going to take up a stinky resolution. They may have already done it today. And it's a meaningless resolution. But it will define the APAC Democrats who are in the House of Representatives. This is a measure to rebuke the Obama administration for failing to veto the U.N. resolution critical of Israel for its illegal settlements on Palestinian land. And, of course, you know I approve of what the Obama administration did. It was just too little and too late. And so we're going to see the APAC Democrats, those who are uh, too close to the Zionist right and the government of Israel. And Steny Hoyer is one of them. He's the number two Democrat in the House. And he tried to spin this up saying, well, the question for our members is, do you agree with the U.S. abstaining that it was positive or do you believe it was not? But this is going to separate Democrats from Obama. And it is going to unite many of these Democrats with the far right in Israel. And as, as I'm having trouble calling him President Trump, uh, as, as Trump uh, tries to cozy up to Israel, and here's one move that I'm going to talk about here next. There are three Republican senators who've introduced legislation, and this is a threat that if they don't get their way, and if Trump and the new administration do not move 
the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which is almost certain to spark a huge backlash from the Palestinians. But if the U.S. doesn't do that, these senators and their bill will cut off 50% of the money for security, construction, and maintenance of all of the U.S. embassies around the world. Now, these are the same people. It's Marco Rubio, it's Ted Cruz, and uh, who's, who's the other guy here? Uh, Nevada Senator Dean Heller. Now, Rubio and Cruz tried to make capital against Obama, who was not on the ballot, in the primaries last year by raising Benghazi and saying that the Obama administration had failed to provide for embassy security around the world. And now they're threatening to intentionally reduce embassy security in this bizarre pandering effort to put pressure on moving the U.S. Embassy into Jerusalem. And we're going to find that many of the Democrats who vote yes on the resolution condemning Obama for not vetoing the U.N. resolution, they'll be right there to support the move of the embassy into Jerusalem. And frankly, as you can tell, I find that pretty disgusting. Kudos to Jeremy Scahill, a journalist who is persistent. He's written about drones. He has written at The Intercept about many issues related to the Obama kill or capture program that doesn't do much capturing. And today he confirms that the U.S. lied to us about why the son of Anwar al-Awlaki, 16-year-old Abdul Rahman al-Awlaki, was killed by a drone strike in 2011. And part of the evidence comes from the fact that the U.S. has offered a $5 million reward and designated a man named Ibrahim Albana as a global terrorist. Now, we're told that Albana was the actual target and that the younger Alaki just happened to be in the vicinity when that uh, Hellfire missile reached its target. But if he wasn't killed that day, then he wasn't there. And the administration has used uh, all kinds of bobbing and weaving and, uh, you know, confirming published accounts without confirming that we conducted a drone strike. But this designation of Albana today raises important questions. Why did the U.S. kill this 16-year-old citizen who was not accused of any terrorist activities? He hadn't even seen his father in years. And one of the telling signs is that when he was killed, the U.S. falsely said he was 21 years old and left the impression that he was an adult-aged militant. The kid was 16. And as I said, no indication of any connection to his father's actions. And that's a whole other story that I'm not going to delve into today. But I've linked to Scahill's article, and I encourage you to read it. I think it provides uh, very important information about uh, the way the Obama administration misled us in the past. A couple of media notes. Our friend and colleague, Jason Leopold, the king of the Freedom of Information Act, he has announced he's left Vice News and will be joining BuzzFeed. I went to the BuzzFeed site today, and boy, you've got to wade through a lot of garbage to get to their news stories, but there is some good news coverage there. Also, uh, a, a longtime pal of mine, Faz Shakir, who was a weekly contributor to my syndicated radio show from 2005 to 2009. He was then at the Center for American Progress. More recently, he's been the research director for Nancy Pelosi and the House uh, leadership operation. And he has announced that he is joining the ACLU in Washington. And I couldn't be more delighted. Congratulations, Faz. Uh, one other media note. The guy that I like to refer to as that little mother, Tucker Carlson, has been promoted to the 9 p.m. primetime slot on Fox News to replace Megyn Kelly. He's a really creepy, snarky uh, <laughs> jerk of a guy. In Norway, technology is proceeding, and the government is ordering the shutdown of all FM radio transmitters across the nation. Now, this is producing some consternation because not everybody has switched to new digital audio broadcasting receivers. But this is the, uh, you know, uh, the wave of the future. Switzerland plans to drop FM broadcasts, Britain and Denmark in 2020 or a little after that. And uh, here in the U.S., who knows? Uh, I haven't heard any rumblings of anything of the sort. And finally, in segment one today, 
This one really bothers me. A city council member in Los Angeles, Mitch O'Farrell, wants to protect kids on the playground. Now, I think that's wonderful. But he has decided to assume that any adult who shows up on a playground without a child has bad intentions. And we are replacing the presumption of innocence here with a presumption of creepiness. And this kind of micromanaging and writing laws that uh, produce these kinds of red tape and restrictions, I find really offensive. And people sometimes, you know, deride them as nanny state rules. But the idea that I cannot sit in a park by myself, reading a book, staring at the, the sky, having my lunch because there are children present and they're not mine and I'm not there in charge of them, I, I just find this ridiculous. And I hope that uh, it doesn't go any further than the proposal stage. And in our second segment today, we're going to go in depth on the drama that continues to unfold in Washington, D.C., behind these uh, hyped, if not false, claims that Russia nefariously hacked the DNC, that they're responsible for the interception of John Podesta's emails, and that they handed them off to WikiLeaks, and that that manipulated the outcome of our election. And as you know, I'm deeply skeptical of this, and uh, I tie it to the kinds of... Uh, psychological operations that have been conducted in the past. And uh, as I mentioned in the first segment today, we were lied to about the drone strike that killed the younger Alaki in Yemen. And later in this segment, I'm going to tell you about new discoveries about other fabrications from the Obama administration. So this would not be the first episode of that sort. And one of the things that occurs to me is that whether he knows it or not, whether he intends it or not, Donald Trump is taking on the deep state. That's right. The CIA, the intelligence community that is uh, seamless, doesn't uh, really pause in between administrations. They train the next president to get him or her to fall in line. Well, no her so far. <laughs> and... Uh, I think that this is a confrontation that is much deeper than the corporate media is making it out to be because the corporate media is taking the side of the intelligence communities to maintain access in the future and because it's a way of trying to uh, rein Trump in by smearing him as a collaborator with Putin, as a collaborator with Assange. And so the stakes here, I think, are, are much higher than many people realize. And with that, we saw today that the proven perjurer and uh, a guy who's in his final days as director of national intelligence, General Jimmy Clapper, was up on the hill spinning up more of that uh, bullshit-based uh, set of assertions. And uh, he was set up with questions from members of both parties to slime Julian Assange and diminish his credibility. And what we're seeing here is that the Democrats are going all in in backing the intelligence community. This is a serious mistake. And it is being done for short-term political reasons. Here's Claire McCaskill, Democratic senator from Missouri. She asked, uh, who benefits from a president-elect trashing the intelligence community? Now, this intelligence community has yet to produce any proof, and today's uh, presentations are no different. They trotted out Clapper and Mike Rogers from the NSA and the Cyber Command. And they basically teased the members about a report that is being given to President Obama today, will be uh, briefed uh, to Trump tomorrow, and Trump says that that was delayed three days, but the CIA disputes that. I don't know. Uh, and then we're going to see a watered-down, declassified version of this report early next week, we're told. Now, that is news because I thought they were just going to keep it all secret and Tell us to trust them. And Clapper offered no, need, new, no new details. But he, he amplified his comments. He said, our assessment now is even more resolute that the Russians carried out the attack on the election. He confirmed there was no Russian hacking that altered the actual vote count and repeated it's not the agency's job to assess the political impact of information released by Russian agents. But he is a tool 
of this political operation. Now, here's something stunning as well. Mike Rogers threatened that if this rift between Trump and the intelligence community continues, that his spooks might go on strike. He cautioned. He said that uh, the motivation to serve in American intelligence is driven in no small part by confidence from our leaders. And without that, there could be a situation where our workforce decides to walk. Now, is that a threat from the deep state? That's how I interpret it. These people are saying, you can't operate without me, and if you continue to disagree with us on the Russia angle here, we're going to screw you somewhere else by not giving you intelligence or by maybe feeding you false intelligence. And Clapper himself, tweaking Trump, said that there's an important distinction between healthy skepticism of intelligence assessments and disparagement. Well, there's a lot to disparage our intelligence community for. They've built the American public billions of dollars unaccounted. They operate above the law, beyond the law. They tortured people and nobody was held to account. I could go on. And once again, I'll underscore that Democrats are making a big mistake by aligning with the intelligence community in this uh, <laughs> very, very dangerous situation. Now, I mentioned BuzzFeed and that Jason Leopold is joining them. Uh, a story there today under the byline of Ali Watkins reports that to date, the FBI has never, ever asked for access to the hacked servers of the Democratic National Committee. Now, we're told they did all this investigating. Then they investigated some more. And then Obama told them to investigate, and that's the report that's coming back. That report is, is going to be issued or delivered after the president has already imposed sanctions based on uh, the findings of the report that he hadn't seen, right? But let me quote here. Six months after the FBI first said it was investigating the hack of the DNC's computer network, the Bureau has still not requested access to those servers. No U.S. government entity has run an independent forensic analysis on the system, one U.S. intelligence official told BuzzFeed News. So <laughs> the 13-page report that was released on December 29th is just more gibberish. It wasn't based on any investigation of the server that we're told was hacked by the Russians. And I want to recommend my in-depth interview that's being released today to subscribers at PeterBCollins.com and all of our outlets with Trent Lipinski, a young cybersecurity analyst based here in San Francisco. And he has written uh, extensively about this on his blog, and I'm linking to the blog in the show file for this podcast, about the skepticism that he has. And it surfaced like mine did back in October when they made these assertions about Russian intentions based on weasel words and lines like, the, this is consistent with Russian behavior. Here's an excerpt from my fascinating conversation with Trent Lipinski. So I immediately question the October 7th statement because, you know, the, the key point of that statement is that they claimed that Russia was somehow interfering with the election process. So they're making this allegation that Russia potentially had some kind of, you know, they were hacking the election process as if they were hacking, you know, voting machines or something crazy like that. Um, but that's not at all what they're inferring. I, I mean, the actual statement from the 7th uh, directly implicates both DCLeaks.com and WikiLeaks, as well as uh, Guccifer 2.0. And, you know, they were trying to... Uh, they were trying to create this impression that, you know, though the evidence, you know, showed that, you know, they had somehow gotten, you know, these leaks from Russia. And then the Russians were then using that to, you know, interfere, or hack the, the election process when no such thing took place. Um, so going back to, you know, the statement that was just released on December 29th, uh, the Department of Homeland Security and FBI released this you know, this statement with, you know, malware, uh, you know, the software essentially that, uh, that, you know, is used for hacking purposes. But the, the actual malware in question is extremely unsophisticated. 
uh, you know, Julian Assange said it perfectly the other night on his Sean Hannity interview. This is something that a 14 year old can download and send to anybody. Um, this is publicly available software uh, to make matters even, you know, more unusual. The software is actually uh, an outdated version. So they're warning, you know, this statement is basically warning the InfoSec community about outdated software that's publicly available that originated from a hacking group in the Ukraine. So, again, not necessarily Russian. Um, so then what's even more bizarre is they released, uh, you know, this list of IP addresses. So an IP address is, you know, the address that, you know, computers use to communicate on the Internet. The problem is, is an IP address is not proof of identity. Uh, you know, there are tactics that can be used to fake IP addresses. You can reroute IP addresses. You can spoof IP addresses. Um, they're, they're not proof that, you know, the person at this address, you know, is physically at this location and has this identity and is, you know, Trent Lipinski. And, um, and, and that's Trent, not how they work. Let me just yeah. add, you're more sophisticated than I am, but I know enough to know that uh, there are many uh, uh, useful purposes for generating an IP address that are not nefarious. And for example, Correct. I have a piece of software that generates IP addresses so that people can connect up with me over the Internet to receive radio programs. And we do it for stability and predictability, not to pretend that I'm actually in Okinawa. <laughs> Correct. There's a lot more in my in-depth interview with Trent Lipinski, and I invite you to listen to the entire package. One of the things we talked about is the effort by the corporate media to smear Julian Assange, following up on President Obama's last uh, news conference where he said, gosh, who are you going to believe, Julian Assange, the Russians, or our own intelligence community? And this false choice is being presented as a way to strengthen the consensus position about Russia hacking that is all based on speculation. And I'm particularly sad to see that Scott Shane, a reporter for the New York Times, whom I respect, published a piece today that uh, has a lot of speculation being passed off as fact. The headline reads, Trump and Julian Assange, an unlikely pair, unite to sow hacking doubts. Now, there's no unity between Trump and Assange. They happen to agree, and they have publicly, you know, embraced each other's point of view. But Trump himself today was tweeting, hey, I'm a big fan of the intelligence community, and the media is lying when it says that, you know, essentially, I have joined forces with Julian Assange. But let me quote from Scott Shane's piece here. It is highly unlikely that anyone approaching WikiLeaks with the emails obtained by the Russian government hacking would acknowledge the source. So he treats as fact the Russian government hacking and then speculates from there and says that it, you know, it, it appears that Assange can't be sure of the ultimate origin of the emails. But that may be true. Still, the CIA has offered us no evidence. No intelligence agency has. And so we're just pissing all over Julian Assange when you can ask the very same questions uh, of the agencies that have made these assertions that are now represented as being 100 percent fact. So uh, it's really troubling to see the corporate media circle its wagons to support Obama, the Democrats, the intelligence community, when they should be impartial. And they should be reporting both sides of this even-handedly and letting readers and viewers decide for themselves. Here's another attack. Though the celebrity businessman and the champion of leakers are both showmen, sometimes derided by critics as narcissists, they might seem to have little else in common. So look at the way those smears were inserted here. Now, I think it's fair, independently, to call both Trump and Assange narcissists. But to then suggest that that is why they are in this uh, alleged collusion around all this is just pure speculation. Here's some more. There, may, there are many reasons to accept the idea that Russian intelligence was behind the hacks and leaks that affected the election. Even if the public case is not yet airtight, experts say. Who are the fucking experts? Well... They cite a couple of people from these private security firms. Then they have government officials who say, yeah, the private security firms have it right. 
But those private security firms have no evidence about this alleged hack. They simply believe it. Here's another quote. Sleuths across the intelligence agencies believe Russia's military intelligence agency is behind the group blamed for the email hacking. Their views are presumably based not just on analyzing the malware and other features of the hacks, but on spy work. Presumably, right? Presumably. This is, <laughs> this is supposed to be fact-based, and it's not. So over at the Washington Post, as if this is tag team smear day for Julian Assange, they put out their fact checker, Michelle Yee Lee, and she goes to bat against Julian Assange because of a comment made by Sean Hannity in their Fox News interview that Assange agreed with. So Hannity said, can you say to the American people unequivocally that you did not get this information about the DNC, John Podesta's emails? Can you tell the American people 1,000 percent you did not get it from Russia? Yes, says Assange. Hannity, or anybody associated with Russia, Assange, we, we can say and we have said repeatedly over the last two months that our source is not the Russian government and it is not a state party. Now, Hannity brought in the 1,000 percent. And Assange fell for it. He said, yes. Nobody can prove with 100% accuracy, much less 1,000%, that any of these things are true. There's just too much that is unknown. But the fact checker at the Washington Post tries to drive a Mack truck through that little, little hole uh, with this. His answer leaves open the possibility that the information could have come through an intermediary. Well, there are many possibilities here. But the U.S. has made flat assertions that Russia hacked, gave it to WikiLeaks, and WikiLeaks published it. And that has not been proven. And the Washington Post does a recitation of what they call the facts, which simply recites the series of anonymous, uh, unidentified leaks from high-ranking intelligence officials. And again, this whole cycle ends up taking speculation and treating it as fact. And this is not <laughs> this is not anything that I consider to be journalism or responsible news reporting. And we're in the middle of a maelstrom here. When it's all over, we'll be able to see it much more clearly. Now, one of the things that Trent Lipinski mentions in the in-depth interview today is that he saw a CNN report where one of their uh, so-called uh, national security experts, a guy named Phil Mudd, was there, and he was smearing WikiLeaks and promoting the Russia hack meme. And then he, he said this. Uh, he suggested that Assange didn't want to taint his operation before astonishingly labeling him as a pedophile who lives in the Ecuadorian embassy in London. Now, this has resulted in a threat from WikiLeaks to sue CNN and presumably uh, Phil Mudd for a false statement. There is no indication, there's been no allegation that I've seen of pedophile behavior by Julian Assange, and this is just an additional way of trying to take him down and get us to ignore that uh, WikiLeaks facilitated the release of actual viable information that voters deserve to know about. Trump has been talking about uh, cutting back or eliminating the director of National Intelligence Department, and I actually think that might be a good idea. Uh, but uh, nonetheless, he has, uh, it's been leaked today that he's going to name former Indiana Republican Senator Dan Coats as the director of National Intelligence. As you may know, I'm conducting a book clearance. The goal is to try to get a car into our garage, and so I have culled uh, hundreds of books that I've been collecting for years. And I've selected a few juicy ones to make available to you uh, if you can help generate some revenue for the Peter B. Collins podcast. So uh, today I'm going to add a book by Madeleine Albright, uh, Bill Clinton's Secretary of State and U.N. Ambassador. Uh, and this is a book that's personal about her. She discovered that she was Jewish late in life and that uh, she had quite an interesting history. And she wrote a book called Prague Winter about that. I have a signed copy to Peter B. Best Wishes, Madeline Albright. And uh, I'll be happy to make this available 
to the first person who claims it with a $100 or more contribution to the Peter B. Collins podcast. I'm still looking for a taker for the Alan Dershowitz signed copy of Hootspa and the two-pack of Patty Davis books, Patty Davis, the daughter of Ronald and Nancy Reagan, uh, her memoir called uh, The Way I See It, and her novel called Bondage, with the inscription about the handcuffs that I bought her to wear during the interview. <laughs> so uh, email peter at peterbcollins.com if you'd like to pick up any of these books. You'll help me uh, clear out my garage and generate some much-needed revenue here at the Peter B. Collins podcast. And finally, uh, one other item that was mentioned in my conversation with Trent Lipinski is the history of false claims coming out of the Obama administration. And a lot of people, you know, point to Bush and the, the selling of the war in Iraq back in 2002, 2003. But since then, we've seen false claims of the, you know, claim that it was the uh, Assad government responsible for unleashing a chemical weapon in Syria in 2014. We saw the government of the United States falsely claim that it knew that Russia was responsible for the downing of MH17 over Ukraine. And now, thanks to Dan Wright at Shadowproof, we know that the, uh, the, the item that surfaced in the summer of 2014, that the U.S. had to be really afraid because the Khorasan group had surfaced in Syria. And we scratched our heads and said, where did this come from? And we all assumed that it was just uh, dreamed up by a CIA person at Langley. Well, now we know that's kind of true. Dan Wright's report indicates that the Khorasan group was not new, as officials had told us, but was essentially a group of uh, people already part of al-Qaeda. And this was a very misleading report that was used to try to strengthen uh, American resolve and public opinion in support of uh, misguided military action in Syria. That's all I have time for today. Thanks for joining me for my news and comment podcast, part one and part two. It's available every day on YouTube and all my other outlets. I'm Peter B. Happy trails to you Until we meet again Happy trails